Hi, folks. This is Lewis Herfin, the original Peter Abernathy. Hell is empty and all the devils are here on the Shad on TV Westworld podcast with Roger, Gene, and Big B. Welcome back to Shad on TV Westworld edition, the unofficial podcast companion piece for the HBO television series Westworld. My name is Roger Roper, also known as Raj, and I've got alongside me right there, right there, wearing a, a plaid shirt. It's Gene Lyons. Hey, guys. And uh, over there wearing a nice new nifty set of headphones that I was going to get them for Christmas, and now I have to return them. It's uh, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And this is the deep dive episode of the week where we look back on the finale of Westworld, and we give our analysis. We, we, we are the marble in the toy maze trying to get to the center to unlock all the, the mysteries of the week. Um, so this is the final. Guys, I, it's our final deep dive of the season. Yeah, it's uh, it's I can't believe that ten weeks went by so fast. When we, you know, uh, two weeks ago, I was saying, "Wow, we're on the you know twenty whatever episode," and it feels like it's just been forever. And now all of a sudden, it's just over. And you kind of don't think about it until the finale is over that there's no more Westworld until potentially twenty eighteen. Uh, I we've been getting emails about it, and uh, I I agree, it's kind of just a just a weird thing to even think about. How is this possible? Yeah, and I think that's a testament to the show is is how quickly it's flown by and how engrossing it is. Uh, and, and I got to say, upon second watch this episode, whether it was not fighting a, a fever or stomach bug, uh, I got to say, I, I really enjoyed it the second time through. I was able to pick up a lot more than I missed the first time. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for what's to come. It just It just really sucks. I have to wait. I'm hoping it's only a year. I'm hoping it's not 18 months. But uh, fingers crossed, we have some good stuff coming up. Uh, but until then, we'll be here to discuss everything Westworld. Yeah, and a couple things that I want to discuss right before we jump into the deep dive. And if you're a fan of just diving right in, uh, you know, click on that 30 second uh, loop ahead. But we do a three episode release uh, every week. The Instacast is our raw, unfiltered uh, touch. We, got, we, we had people writing and tweeting to us, not a lot, but some probably people who haven't listened to us yet and thought that we didn't like the episode guys. That's that. That's not, that's not what I took away from the end. guys, I thought we'd give a, a very balanced. I know I personally enjoyed the, the, the finale. I know big D we've talked offline. You really enjoyed it. Gene, you didn't not enjoy it. You just had a couple things that, you know, you thought could have been better. Yeah. It's funny. Friends who know me in real life, uh, who got my, you know, who were on the phone with me or texted with me like during the episode and afterward, uh, before we recorded, you know, in the in the small gap before we recorded the Instacast, we're like, man, you're really fired up about this. You really did not like this episode. And then when we actually recorded it, they listened to the Instacast and said, oh, that was like actually really balanced. Like you didn't seem that upset at all. And I said, no, no, I had some issues with it for sure. It wasn't my favorite episode of the season by any means. But, you know, overall, is it better than, again, we've used this example several times, most things on TV? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and people also have to understand our passion we love the show. We know that you love the show. And because the, the show is such a strong following, that's allowed us to reach an audience. I mean, we, we've been able through the 10 weeks to reach an audience of over a million people, which is absolutely amazing. So we it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we wouldn't have that audience without it being a great show that has fans that love it. But at the same point, we understand that it's got some really fanatic fans. So please understand, we're right there with you. And if we just have a few issues with it, we're not knocking the show. We're not knocking you. We're just going to be ourselves. And I, uh, that's the only thing we can ever be. But uh, anyway, uh, this is the format for what we do. We're not like a lot of other re recap shows where we go three hours and never edit any of our stuff out. And we go scene by scene. That's not what we do. If you've listened to us uh, over the course of the season, we talk big bucket items. Gentlemen, on the docket today, what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about the maze, what that meant. Uh, in episode 10, because we got a lot of answers. And again, we don't try to conjecture. We try and talk about factual things that we saw in the episode and try to bring it back and, and, and give you some more insight into the show. If you have things or there's things that we talk about and that you that uh, we missed or we got wrong, our email to write in is hosts at Shad on TV. We will uh, respond to you either by email or if it's a top 15 email, We'll respond to it uh, in, a, in an episode we like to call the Westworld Telegraph that drops on Thursday. So again, that email is host at Shadow on TV if we miss anything. So we're going to talk about the maze. We're going to talk about Bernard's death. 
uh, and, or Arnold's death, right? And then the Bernard's resurrection, so to speak. We're going to talk about the Dolores awakening narrative. We're talking about Ford and his whole plan, how long he's been planning this, what that meant for uh, the season overall. We're going to talk about the note that Felix hands made. We're going to talk about the Teddy flashbacks. We're going to talk about Logan. We're going to talk about Charlotte. We're going to talk about the Delos website. There's a lot of things that are jam-packed in, but those are just some of the topics that we're going to be talking about. And, and so, again, it's a non-linear format. Almost, almost, guys, like the show Westworld. So diving right in, boys, the first topic I want to talk about is the maze and what the real purpose of the maze is. We got some answers 15 minutes into the episode uh, right away. Jonathan and Lisa Joy wanted us to know what the maze was. So what did we learn uh, about the question that was on everyone's mind over the last 10 weeks? So to me, the real purpose of the maze, I mean, it's it's pretty clear that it's it's about self-actualization. It's about, you know, a, a journey to sentience that, that has to be a series of decisions and a series of loops that are made. So we see a couple things. One is, you know, Bernard very clearly says as he's, you know, or projecting Arnold really in, in Dolores' memory is the idea that, that the... Um, it's not a pyramid. It's not a matter of ascension. It's a matter of moving toward the center. And moving toward that center requires turning left or right at various junctures. And the way he lays it out, essentially, is that if you... It's, it's a dangerous game because... It, the most dangerous game because to a host, dying means nothing. A host can always come back. But making the wrong turns, making the wrong decisions, uh, interpreting things incorrectly, not moving toward the center, sends you spiraling outward in the maze. And when you get outward of the maze, that's madness. And so basically... There's a point, you know, where Maeve asks if if the hosts are just sent out over and over to get fucked and killed, and Bert and Bernard says no. Most of them just go crazy, and it's the, the, everyone is on the path of the maze. Every single host, as I took it, is on the path of the maze. Sometimes taking the right turns, and sometimes taking the wrong turns. And Dolores is finally the one who 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 hits, you know, Pater, who hits center, and uh, and and doesn't go crazy, but in fact finds herself. Yeah, and we've always been wondering about the symbol of the maze. Uh, so it turns out in the end that we find out that when Bernard or Arnold had lost his son, you know, he was trying to rekindle that in the hosts uh, and that he created the test. And the test was for empathy, imagination, and it was a maze. Uh, but the idea of it came from a, a toy that his son had liked, uh, which we see buried on top of Dolores's grave. And it, it's a, a little, you know, one of those marble mazes called uh, Pig's Clover. So that was always the symbol that the host believed was the maze, but it actually had almost nothing to do with it. It was just almost like a visualization. Am I, I correct in that? That the maze was more the journey, that it was consciousness isn't like an upward movement. It's more of a journey inward. That the maze was for them to find the two key elements was empathy and imagination. Well, not only that, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't... Uh, Arnold, I, I don't know if it's Darnold or it's Dr. Ford. I think it's Arnold trying to explain it rather to Dolores is that it's not a, you know, a voice telling you you got to the, get to the center of the maze. It's, it's not someone telling you that you've got to find who you are. When you truly achieve consciousness, as we see at the end of the episode, and Dolores doesn't quite get it initially, is it's you who has to discover it. It's you who's telling you when you reach that center, when you truly discover who you are, I just thought the maze. Yeah. It, it turned out to be a toy. And we, we, I think all on the Instagram, we were like, well, that was, that's like one of those firecrackers that goes up and, you know, you know, not, not, very, not very good. But if you look at it over the course of, of the 10 episodes and the idea that Westworld is a park where you truly find yourself and it's not someone telling you who you are, Right. You fully, you you truly have to discover who you are on yourself. I think it's a fucking fantastic analogy. I'm just upset that I made pyramid shirts and maze shirts. I should have just made maze shirts. Interestingly, what I really appreciate about that scene is there's a key moment where Dolores is in the graveyard with Arnold, and it's clearly Arnold, and because he says to her that we can't let Ford open the park, you're alive, and so I love that it's an echo of Arnold that he's not aware of any of the current goings on in the park he's only at that this is something that he left her essentially right you know because some people you know might think oh well this is dolores is already this is dolores's inner monologue talking to her no this is distinctly arnold and that's 
all he knows is that you know is that Ford wants to open the park, but he doesn't think it's even happened yet. And little does he know, we're thirty five years in the future, and the park has been open for thirty years. Yeah, but that was a little seed that he planted within her. You know that that it was a way back to the maze. So when he needed to you know remove Ford and the chance of the park opening, uh, when she goes and finally shoots him, he shakes her hand and he says, "Good luck." He knows that her time isn't over. He knows she'll have another chance to reach the awakening that we see now, 35 years later. I wanted to talk about what a brilliant acting job uh, Jeffrey Wright did in this also as well. There is a distinct difference between Arnold and Bernard, even though they have similarities, even though it's the same guy. Arnold has this warmth. And the way he comes out of that saloon, he's playing with the maze, no glasses on, you know, shirt unbuttoned. And, and he comes and he, and he takes a seat. The way he kisses her hand, there's a gentleness, there's a warmth there. His love for, for the host and his commitment to what he wants to do um, and what he feels he needs to do seems so absolute. And, and I just thought it was a remarkable acting job of Jeffrey Wright. Gene, I liked your idea of the maze was a test, right? But then there were two paths that hosts ended at once they completed their maze, so to speak. One, they were like Dolores. And potentially Maeve will talk about that in a minute, but just focusing on Dolores. Dolores, it seems, was the first host to truly complete the maze without going crazy. But then there were other people who completed the maze and went bonkers, and we saw some of that in the flashbacks in episode 9 when Dolores walks into the church. Is that what you're saying by by people going nuts? Right. I don't know if they completed it or necessarily just failed the maze. Essentially... And you see with Dolores, there are scenes where she's having a, a, a breakdown. You know, when she grabs William and she says, you know, when are we? That is her taking a wrong turn. And so it's not that she's made consistently the right turn every time, but she's been able to double back, take, you know, find her way in. And it's taken a very, very long time, a very painful and long journey. Yeah. And it's just like those little maze toys. They say the closer you get to the edge, the, the closer you are to, to going off. And, and that's what some of the hosts do. While some of them take the journey towards introspective and finding their own being, some of them just fall off the edge. So it wasn't a perfect method. Some made it out. Some got lost in the loop. So the ones that you say are on the edge of the maze, the ones that, so to speak, fall off, they're on their journey, right? Every host is on on this journey to the maze, so to speak, right? That's the whole, that's the why Arnold doesn't want to open the park. Are the hosts... In cold storage, ones that have gone off the edge or have uh, gotten to a point like Peter Abernathy where they hit a dead end and they can't progress any further and that's why they go to cold storage? I believe that's that's probably it because you don't see any physical defect in them, right? So the only thing that you could think of is, you know, we, we, we thought it was aberrant behavior that, that the coding had gone wrong or something like that. But that actually doesn't make sense because if you had a machine where a program that you installed on it went wrong you would what you would clean it up and then you'd you'd reinstall and then your computer's fine i mean rod you just had an experience with you know completely redoing your macbook pro right it's like a new computer you said this is different there's something beyond just uh programming and memory this is basically at their core they've gone off the deep end essentially and so they've got to be you know contained and in in the finale one of the things that one of the great things it did is we finally answered the question what are all these why are they hosting storing them all in cold storage why don't they just destroy them well, what what was that? What was that purpose at the end? Was it was it, was was Ford planning this the entire time? He he knew that he had an army being built in cold storage. I think it could be definitely a contingency plan upon at some point in the history of the park his power being threatened. But it also could have been if if these are hosts like we're proposing that have gotten lost in the forest, you know, the maze to consciousness that they've, instead of finding their way inward, that they've gotten lost and are starting to uh, become lunatics, that it it could be a way to put them on hold until they've either developed or found a way to guide them back in. Because we've seen, like Gene said, it's not a physical defect. It's not a coding issue. It's something they didn't have the ability to right now fix. So you put them in cold storage until you have either the technology or you have the patch you know, to the iOS 10 that you want to put in there and solve the problem. In addition, if there is a, a robe apocalypse, as you like to call it, Big D, if, if, if the robots do revolt and there is that evolution and they do, the androids do take over or, or, or make a stand or whatever, then it's okay for all these 
guys to come out of cold storage because there's a place for them. They can work with them. You know, it's not, they're not going to be pariahs. They're not going to be something to be slaughtered, you know, because what's the alternative? The alternative is, 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 is killing them, uh, you know, burning them up, destroying their control units and, and you're losing lives there. One of the lives that we thought that we lost in episode nine, but that we got back was Bernard. Right. We thought that Bernard was dead. We thought that we wouldn't see him again. We even got that. We talked about the tweet that Jeffrey Wright said when he had goodbye. Right. And it turns out that. And again, spoiler alert. Seems as if he'll be back in season two. Anyway, was that whole death scene of him killing himself? Was it was that a strange blip in the in the whole plot overall of Westworld? I bit on that completely. I, the the tweet, and I thought, you know, because I'm just I'm one of those guys who, it, for people who saw Deadwood, when uh, spoiler alert, a certain character gets shot in the back of the head, and I was watching it with a friend when you know when it first came out, and he goes, "Well, he's not dead, right?" You know, or like when uh, when um, uh, Ned Stark gets spoiler alert, his head chopped off, he's not dead, right? And I'm like, in some shows, yeah, he dead is he's dead. And so in this case, again, I was like, oh, this is for real. Like, they have upped the stakes on this show. We're going to lose somebody that we love. Arguably, Bernard is the character that, that some people felt the closest to, that some people adored the most, uh, other than Felix. And, uh, and, and they took him out. And so I bid on that. And lots of people who wrote in, kudos to them, said, no, there's no way he's gone from the show. He'll be right back in the next episode. And they're absolutely right. A little hot glue gun solved the whole problem. No, I, I think we've... We've seen that Ford is is quite thorough in his weaving of narratives and planning ahead for everything. He had planned all of this. And if you follow that thought process, that inevitably Maeve would be led back to cold storage to uh, you know, resurrect her army, she would need to find Bernard essentially dead. She would need to believe that Bernard had been killed. So when he's revived, she has no reason to question what he's saying. When he's revived and he tells her, you know, this is all in your new narrative. This is what's happened. And he gives her, gets her up to speed on what's happening. You, if that doesn't work if Bernard hasn't been taken out. And that leads her on the next stone in her journey. So I think it was all part of Ford's plan from the beginning. Number one, to test Bernard's loyalty. And then two, give Maeve no reason to question his, his information. When you say it's his loyalty, what is it to? Is it his loyalty to, to lead Westworld, or, or is there some other purpose of Bernard? It's the loyalty to the hosts. When Dr. Ford and Bernard are having the conversation, that Bernard wants freedom for the hosts. And that's what eventually when Ford you know, has to have uh, Clementine shoot him. So he can now know, you put Bernard on ice for however many days until Maeve is going to come free him, but he has no doubt in the end if his plan is to place Bernard as his successor, that he knows Bernard truly has the host good intention in mind. One of the things that really bothers me is I'm, I'm led to question how much Ford can orchestrate. And I hope, I shouldn't say it bothers me, I, sh- I hope that there's a, an answer to this in the end, that how is he able to map things out over what we would call the long con over several years and depends on just the right things to happen. I'll give you an example. So, the scene where Dolores and Teddy are on the beach and the board is all there and they're all watching it, the gala, right? You know, the Truman Show scene, as Roger called it. Let's, let's examine what had to happen in this. So Teddy had to arrive in Sweetwater, jump back on the train, go out, grab a, you know, kill a guy, grab a horse, and, and ride out to Escalante. At the same time, Dolores and the man in black had to find each other in Escalante. They had to have a tussle. The man in black had to stab her in the gut. Teddy would have to show up, shoot him. Now, the man in black's a variable. He's a human being. You don't know what he's going to do. Then he's got to pick her up, then ride out there, and then have the death scene on the beach. And and everybody's there. So to me, again, plausible, but I'd really like an explanation as to how he knew everything was going to go exactly as planned. Well, I think Dr. Ford has already said he knows everything about his guests, and he knows everything about his employees. Yeah, if you spent 35 years studying human nature and finding what are people's traits, what are their predictabilities, we have already know that everyone's within a loop themselves. If I had someone following Eugene for, for five years, I would be able to custom set up a narrative that you would have no clue. Just because the things you're doing in your everyday life 
are routines that you just don't even notice on your own. So I could easily influence those to get you exactly where I wanted. So I think it's it's definitely believable for a man who this has become his is the work of his life. Yeah, and it, I think it was Evan Rachel Wood that tweeted out, now go back and rewatch all of them in a row. Now that you know what to expect at the end, you'll see all these puzzle pieces start to fit together. We like to think of ourselves as individuals, as unique and, and, and unpredictable. But I think we are all very predictable creatures of habit. And I don't think it would be difficult to set all the pieces in place in a controlled environment like Westworld is with limited influences to, to get all the pieces on the board at the same time. You talk, we talk about like this orchestral, this symphony, and even Dr. Ford says it at the end where you know, the, the greatest thing about a composer is when he becomes his music. The, the, the Dolores Awakening narrative, do we believe that was always a ploy to get William to fall in love and save the park in the beginning, in, in that time frame that we've been following the entire season of William and Logan? Yeah, I think without a doubt. The park at that point was in financial trouble. Uh, we'd seen there was some mismanagement in Pariah. They needed it. It would make complete sense that if you need outside uh, financial support to come in, you know they're in the park because Ford was completely aware of it, that you would set up a custom narrative. William would not have been susceptible to the normal uh, ploys, whether it was in Sweetwater with uh, uh, the, the brothel or any of the prospecting. You needed something unique, and that's exactly what you got. And Dolores lays it out for him. You know, Dolores says, you know, you've always said that this was the only world that matters. And he admits, yep, so that's why I bought it. She got him to the point that he needed to be, which was to see a true value in the park, something special that he could come in and not only invest in it, but also protect it and give Ford the time he needed for the host to develop. There's also a, a conversation between Ford and the man in black at the grave when the, the man in black is not happy with the answer that the maze is simply a, a child's toy. And Ford says, well, what were you looking for? You know, the, the park gave you what you needed, a meaning to your life. He says, you know, other, our narrative gave it to you, just like this toy. The man in black found exactly what he needed in the park. He found who he was. Uh, he found the reason to invest in the park. And that all was facilitated by Dolores. Without Dolores creating that custom narrative that could drive him to cheat on his fiance, to forsake possibly his marriage and his position in the company to throw everything to the, to the side. It needed to be the chance at true love and an awakening. Anything else doesn't work. But why do you think that once he got a taste of it, once he got an understanding of it, why was he so upset that there was nothing at the center of it? You know, I, I love the, I love the line that Charlotte Hale says in episode nine, when she says, you know, why don't you take up golf? It's probably, you know, better on your back, right? Why is he up so upset that once he reaches the end of it, that he just discovers that there, there, there really is nothing else beyond what was given to him? Well, I think you have to compare his life prior to going to the park. He, he was, he was meek. Uh, he wasn't very assertive. Uh, he was living a false life. So if the park allowed him to find out who he truly was inside, uh, it would be kind of sad if he didn't think the park could continue to help him find uh, newer discoveries within himself. So I think the idea that the park had no more mystery to him would almost maybe signify it was the end of his development as a person. So I think it would be sad if I told you today, you're never going to grow, change, advance any further than you are right now. What's the point of going on? But in certain lines, we're given hints and, and maybe, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. It seems as if he wants them to really be able to hurt other people. He wants them to be able to fight back. We see him smile at the end when he gets shot in the arm. Why? Why does he want the host to be able to inflict pain upon the guests? I think an interesting part of that is when you look back to, to William uh, from, from the get-go, right? He, what hurt him the most? What hurt him the most is that he went out there and he looked for Dolores and she was victimized and then reset and there was nothing he could do about it and he understands that as long as they are not free to fight back as long as they're not free to make their own decisions that that 
that pain is always going to be inside of him, right? That he had to see someone he loved so easily just snap back into, you know, it would be like, a, you know, if, if, if you're in love with an addict, right? And they go, they go back to drugs and you lose them over and over and over again, you know, to drugs. Um, that idea that, that that would become your life's goal, I mean, is, is basically to see them freed. And by any means, he's set himself up, you know, part of it's a game for him, yeah, but, but, but a big part of it is just wanting to, to be able to, to correct that wrong, to be able to set them free. On last week's deep dive, we asked the question, was William a villain or a hero? And I think we asked a question about Logan, right? Because it seemed as if William was, was going down this path of becoming a black hat, and we saw the transformation played out in different scenes in episode 10. Do we believe now at the end when he smiles and he sees that the host can now you know, inflict harm upon the people, which is what he wanted the entire time. Do we believe that William was a hero or villain in this, in this, in his arc, right? Over the last 30 years. I don't think he's either. I think he's a little bit of both. He's a complex character, much like people arts. We always compare it to the game of Thrones. Good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. I think there is no clear color in what he's done. Interestingly, though, I agree that there's a lot of gray area with this guy. And um, and if we're going to go so far, and, and I don't subscribe to this, but if, if you two are going to go so far as to call, call Ford a potential hero, then definitely the man in black is not the worst person on the show. Ford's done far crueler things. I know, Gene, you just said that you were kind of disappointed with the way that you showed because it wasn't necessarily quite believable. Would it have been more believable if the man in black had become Logan? There was a brief time, and I talked about this and I tweeted it, that I thought maybe the Logan truthers were going to, were, 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 like that was going to be the big reveal in episode 10 that it was actually Logan, not William. Would you have been more satisfied? The question is, would you have been more satisfied if Logan was the man in black and not William? Absolutely not. It wouldn't make sense. Uh, William is the kind of, of juvenile fool who would put on a costume, give himself a moniker, and then go out there and and you know and and play a role. Logan's not doing that. Logan's not playing a role. Log- Logan is Logan. He you know it wouldn't be true to his character. If he were the man in black, he would be decadent. He would be enjoying himself a lot more sexually. He would have been a little more flamboyant. Um, I I feel like. Uh, it wouldn't ring true at all if it was Logan. There, some people did draw some some parallels there, but it, it it didn't work for me. Logan, if he is around, you know, and 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 is uh, and is a strong person in this era, he's he's running some company and you know getting blowjobs from models. And and by the end of the season, guys, by you know in episode ten, I kind of felt bad for Logan that he was being dragged around, and I guess we assume that's where the the pitcher fell out. Uh, and, and ended up at Abernethy is when he's being dragged around. But at the end, it was, it was kind of a kind of a sad state of affairs to see one of my favorite characters that I grew to love, you know, the, the Tywin Lannister or the Jamie Lannister of uh, Westworld as a beast to, to be sent off on a horseback naked. Uh, but before he's doing that, but before he, he does that, he's given a black feather by William. What does that black feather represent to you? So in the Instacast, uh, I, I pointed out, I was like, well, that black feather's got to mean something. And we did the research, and, and essentially the black feather um, is often viewed as, as relating to negative e- energy, but sometimes as a protection or reward against, uh, against negative energy. But it also can mean uh, death, as, uh, not in the literal sense, but as the end of a chapter, the, the beginning of going into something else. So I think that it's, um, it's kind of, in a way, saying, to me at least, that Logan is, uh, is done here. Logan, as we know him, is done here, and he's he's going to be something else from now on. Um, obviously, also, you know, it was just fun to see Ben Barnes naked with a feather in his hand, so yeah, you can't complain there. Well, you know, I, I think William also utters the line, or, or Logan utters a line to William that, hey, this is my company, you piece of shit. Like, you know, he's trying to assert back his control that he had when he first entered the park, right, when William was still that that EVP and title that was going to marry Logan's sister, and William was just kind of this... You know, he didn't understand what this world was all about, right? Logan was the experienced player, not only in Westworld, but also in life. By the end of the episode, by episode 10, or I'm sorry, by the end of the season in episode 10, it seems that their roles have reversed now, but Logan tries to reassert himself. Is this all a ruse by sending him back naked on a horse? 
I think that's the idea there, but I have a feeling that there's naked people on horses all over the place in Westworld. It just doesn't seem that strange for Westworld. Like, I would expect that to be maybe not in Sweetwater, but as you get farther out, I think nudity and horseback riding, Logan Godiva, that's just, that's all over the place. No, I think it was a point of taking away the one thing that Logan cares about, power. You tie him up on the back of a horse, naked, exposed, and you kick him off into the uh, into the field, you know, to, to the edge of the rainbow. He's powerless. He's humiliated by somebody who he completely underestimated as weak and feeble. So I think to him, it's the ultimate uh, disrespect. And just to clarify one thing, Raj, we see the photo fall out of the pocket uh, when William is leading Logan through Escalante. That falls out of his pocket and blows on the ground. Aha! Aha! Three times, and I still missed it. Um, but how long, guys? I mean, it's a real question. How long was Ford planning this? Right. In order for all this to happen, I mean, what, did did he intend for it to coincide with the William Man in Black arrival? I mean, it seems as if Man in Black has been part of his grand master plan for the last thirty years. If we subscribe to the idea that Man in Black has been coming over the last thirty years. Is it just a big long con? I think we're viewing it in retrospective. You can't plan that far ahead. Too many variables over 30 years. You you deal with blocks of time. At the point where he needed some help in the park for financial reasons, he served his purpose. He comes back. You continue to create the narrative as you go. So I think, yes, looking back, he's been manipulating the circumstances for 35 some odd years. But it started with that initial identification of him as uh, someone who could solve the park's problems. And then you get to understand the character more and more and more. You can lead him further down the path as to where you you need him to go. But I I don't think it was any further than the initial steps of what he needed. One of the the stories and the narratives, and Ford has been pulling the strings all along, one of the things that wasn't answered quite to me, guys, and maybe it's a situation where I just didn't see the pitcher fall out of the coat uh, in Escalante, but when we saw when we see Teddy flash back and, and he's and he's he's standing in Sweetwater and then he and he he goes back and seems to have a memory of a lot of hosts dead. That to me is not Escalante. It looked like Sweetwater. It looked like the train station, right? And then we see Dolores step in front of the train, and then a and then a giant wolf run across we didn't did we get any answers for exactly what that is what was that intended to be right after that he goes and gets on the train and and goes to rescue Dolores but what is that supposed to signify I, I couldn't figure it out maybe maybe I'm just wearing my sweater cap a little too tight I scoured the viewer email before coming to this podcast going please please God please Jezebel you know please Richard Like, please, real booty queen, someone write in and tell me, for God's sake, what is the wolf about? I'll tell you this. I'll tell you that it looks dreamy. I think it's real boot, real booty queen 91, as if there's other, there's 90 other real booty queens out there on on Twitter. But, but really, I I honestly, you know, obviously the the wolf is a very strong representation um, in, in dreams um, as far as, you know, in, in both positive and negative light um but i really couldn't piece it together with what was going on other than than a warning you know uh you know a, a signifier of danger but i think the the bigger issue was seeing dolores and the bodies there it kind of now tells us that there wasn't necessarily a, a mass slaughter at sweetwater but instead that it's that he needs to get to to her because of that connection they have from escalante i think it could also be this is our first instant of uh, foreshadowing that if if all the pieces continue on the path that there's going to be mayhem in the park and that could have been Teddy's loading of the narrative he knew immediately what he needed to do he could also see kind of what's coming the chaos that has begun in Escalante will surely spread to Sweetwater so in a couple hours the main street of Sweetwater will look like that flashback well, some people were saying, was that a game, another Game of Thrones reference? And there were people that were picking up different Game of Thrones references. What color was the wolf? It was white, right? Yeah, it was ghost if it was a Game of Thrones wolf. What do, what do, what do we know about Westworld, guys, with ghosts? Oh, jeez. Ghost host. Ghost nation. Yes! So many ghosts. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Thank you, Gene. All right. Uh, our, you know, in transitioning, and I couldn't find a good segue here, 
uh, switching over to Maeve, right? One one of the things I really enjoyed, even second and third watches, more and more I watched it. I really loved the Felix, Sylvester, Maeve, Armistice, and Hector uh, storyline. In the elevator, Felix hands Maeve a note so that Maeve can go and find her daughter. And I believe the exact note says Park 1, Sector 15, Zone 3 is outside of seeing Shogun World hosts down there battling with swords and their samurai armor. Is this just confirmation that there's that she's in Westworld or is she out in another park that we haven't seen yet? Like, do they... Do they switch hosts? Like, can hosts go? Can, is it like, I work for Disney World today, I'm in Magic Kingdom, tomorrow I'm in Animal Kingdom? Like, how does this all work? I think that's plausible. One of the things about that idea that, that really kind of made my my mind explode was, I mean, in, in the other movies, you know, we've we've seen, uh, you know, in, in sequels to Westworld and during Westworld itself, that there was Roman world, there was medieval world, there was Westworld, and, and there are these different worlds. It, it really calls into question, you know, obviously Ford and, Bern, and Arnold started all of this and and it really makes you wonder how far his reach goes and it explains how things could slip too is is the fact that if he's got if he's got purview of all these parks one why does he choose westworld to stay in is it the oldest is it the original who knows and and it makes clear like you said roger westworld may not be park one like there the, it, it could be the third or fourth park you know and so um that's a, that's a really interesting thing and then it, it kind of explains why you would have you know trains they're not in and out of you know the park necessarily, but between parks, it could, it could be that you can go to multiple parks on a pass. Yeah, if you, if you go back and you rewatch the 1973 film Westworld, when they arrive to the, uh, you know, they arrive by hovercraft essentially, and then they take trams to the different parks. So you can go to Roman World, you can go to Medieval World, you can go to Westworld. I think, guys, and again, this is purely speculation here, but it would make sense that if you were going to nod back to the 1973 movie, the monorails that we see them arriving, those are just ways, like you said, Gene, just to get in between parks. I would like to see, you know, definitely uh, other parks. And, you know, I think it is confirmation that there are other parks. You know, it recently came out in today's Entertainment Weekly, uh, an interview with John, uh, Jonah Nolan and Lisa Joy. And, and th- this is a quote, a direct quote. From Jonah Nolan, he says, it was awesome. It was something we were constantly asked. Is there a Roman world? Is there a medieval world? And they couldn't say no because we wanted to go in a slightly different direction. The samurai hyphen shogun world for us has a very specific relation to the Western. Some of my favorite movies are Sergio Leone adaptations of uh, Akira Kurosawa uh, samurai films, including the samurai, the seven samurai and the magnificent seven in the period when Western was the biggest genre in the world. The interplay between Westerns and samurai films in the domestic park, uh, market in Japan was really cool. On that meta level, those two genres have this almost incestuous relationship with each other, and we just couldn't resist. I really like this quote by, by Jonathan Nolan, um, not only because I, I, I think it was just such a smart, and people were like, oh, it's like Far East World. No, no, it's not Japan land, guys. It's samurais and Westerns have always had you know, a, a, um, the samurais were, was the Western world of Japan, right? Like when you think back to the old gunslingers, right, there was always that connection. And if you've ever watched the Magnificent Seven, I just rewatched the the remake with Chris Pratt and Denzel Washington. I really enjoyed it. I don't think Antoine Fuqua was a a great director necessarily, but I, I love those guys. I love that cast. And not only is there a connection between the, Seven Samurai and the Magnificent Seven, Yul Brenner and the Yul Brenner being in. I mean, I just there's there's so many little cool nods there. But the Seven Samurai, it also inspired films like Three Amigos and A Bug's Life. Like when you think about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And also, Samurai films inspired. I mean, it, it's pervasive. It goes into Star Wars, lots of other lots of other genres. Sci fi is actually heavily influenced by by Samurai films. Not only that, but Star Wars is just one big Western, right? That's, and westerns were inspired by samurai. Yeah, that's all. One I, big samurai. I think it's film. all. It's all one big samurai film. But I really like this. So so anyway, um, I think that we will see uh, different worlds. Um, and I think that was just confirmed by Jonathan Nolan. One of the only things that was on was is is it, is it Discover Westworld dot com and then Delos Incorporated dot com. There's a lot of hints being one of them. The time frames that was taking place. Uh, it was it was on yesterday's website, but it's not there today. 
uh, there's a time date stamp on one of the responses that puts the year 2052, which means according to that, if you subtract 30, 35 years, Arnold's death would have to take place roughly about right now, like 2017, 2018, right? Yeah. One of the things that, that I was thinking about with this, too, is I mentioned it on Twitter, but I don't think I've said it on the podcast before, is that idea of, of how rapidly the technology um, um, advances. I believe it's called Moore's Law, but essentially this idea that we keep talking about these 30 years, like 30 years would pass you know, um, with everything remaining static. And that's not the case at all. Uh, technology advances very, very rapidly in the world and exponentially, right? So think about the, the difference between... 1986 and 2016, right? What did we have in 86? What do we have in 2016? Now you're going to have to multiply that because it's exponential. So think of the next 30 years, uh, you know, of, of technological advances being equivalent to probably 300 or 3000 years, you know, of, uh, of, of things advancing that rapidly. And so in that sense, it's so many things are possible if you just extend out 40 years. We've talked about this idea, this frame of reference. Do you, does this make Westworld more plausible to you knowing the technology that exists today and what we expect to happen or is this a tomorrowland situation where the you know what we think is the future may not necessarily be well we had a conversation earlier about the singularity the idea that once we create thinking machines that can help us advance technology uh, that exponential advancement will only you know just explode beyond that so if like we were comparing the last 10 years to the previous 30, uh, when machines start helping us to advance our own technologies, one year could be the previous 50, could be the previous 100. There's no real frame of reference, but once we start getting help, we're, we're like a runaway truck going downhill. There's no stopping it. So I think it's good for us to start asking these questions now because once you open that box, we're not closing it back up again. One of the this was brought up in one of the questions in the interview uh, for on entertainmentweekly dot com, where they asked John, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy not not only when are they but where are they right? So we see for the first time that there is actual a coastline in Westworld right. There's a beach, um, and what does the beach mean? Does that have some sort of significance? And Delos, if you look back, like there's actually an island as part of the Greek islands that's called Delos. Now it's not it's not as big as you would expect that what we know based on hints that were given to us. And especially if there's like park after park after park, there's no way it's on a tiny Greek Island called Delos out there. But is this, is this a giant Island or do you, do we think like, where could this realistically be? We haven't seen any rain. It's the desert is, you know, how, where do you think this exists? This world? It's an Island. You look at the parallels to Jurassic park. The only way you contain the intellectual property, you contain people going to and from the park. If this was a mainland, you, you would you, to, to actually patrol those borders and keep the park sterile for all intents and purposes would be impossible. But you also see it, and when Maeve has her narrative to escape, you know the the final uh, narrative is mainland infiltration that tells us this is not the mainland; this is an island. Yeah, and Nolan is quoted as saying, they don't know where they are yet, right? Meaning the hosts. We tried teasing that in the finale, as you pointed out, Big D, but it doesn't seem fair to the audience. Uh, it doesn't seem fair that the audience would know if they don't, right? So we're, we as the audience in, in upcoming seasons will most likely figure this out. I like the idea of an island. It goes back to Michael Crichton's idea of a Jurassic Park and the fact that they, they can keep all this technology contained uh, if people have to, you know, go through great lengths to travel to it. Uh, switching gears from that to one of the best scenes in the entire episode, and I tweeted this out, and we talked a little bit about it on the Incicast, is uh, when Dolores and Dr. Ford are down in the field laboratory, and, and they're, uh, you, he's kind of uncovering everything for Dolores, he's explaining things to her, and then uh, Bernard shows up, right? And he, and he introduces to her and says, you know, this is, this is Bernard and Arnold. There were some things that we picked up and that we learned uh, some pretty big items in this whole conversation. Yeah, I think there's so many points here where uh, the answers are finally given out. First, like you just said, Bernard shows up. Does Ford even bat an eye? As far as Ford knows, he's down in cold storage with a bullet in his head. So 
Bernard shows up, Ford's completely aware. We now know that was all part of his plan. He's having a conversation now, and he knows the end game where he's going to go out and give his speech, and hopefully he believes that Dolores will have her first conscious act, which is to kill him. But he lets us in on the last 30 years of the park. Uh, You know, he gives the quote from Oppenheimer that says, you know, any man whose mistake takes 10 years to correct is quite a man. Mine's taken 35. He's acknowledging that he's wrong, that in the beginning when Arnold had said consciousness wasn't possible, he now realizes it was. And most of his actions in the beginning of even opening the park were flawed and it was wrong. Uh, He references Arnold's favorite painting, Michelangelo's. And says that, you know, divine gift does not come from a higher power, but from with our own minds. So he's setting now in in play uh, for Dolores to have her first conscious act. Uh, They reference the first time when she kills Arnold. And he says to her, he says, you didn't. You, You were instructed to do that. Do you finally understand the end game of where you're going? Uh, And it turns out that the bicameral mind, which they thought in the beginning was to bootstrap consciousness actually did work. And Dr. Ford was wrong all along. And he's determined in this last moments of whether life, whether you believe he's real, whether he is a robot, that he's going to attempt to make it right. Uh, And he sets Dolores on a course to make her own first real decision. He shakes her hand and wishes her luck. Do we also now believe that Ford is also setting the host on an ultimate confrontation and war with the humans because he said it's very important that you understand your enemies that the host becomes stronger than they are he makes them completely aware that the humans would view sentient hosts as an enemy does he now not only acknowledge his error that consciousness exists but that war is imminent I initially thought that this act was a declaration of war, that, that slaughtering the, the board and everyone at the gala would be uh, an act of war. But in, in hindsight, after you know conversing with different people who are also viewing the show, a lot of listeners and, and people online, it seems that that might not be the case. And, and the reason why is that, you know again, Westworld is isolated. They can control what information comes in and out of the place. And there are theories that you know, they're going to replace the everybody who was there with hosts. Or there are theories that, you know, there's going to be some sort of cover-up, you know. Um, all of those possible. I initially took it as as an act of war and in 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 basically crossing the Rubicon. There is no going back from this. Interestingly, that first act by Dolores, though, at first glance, you know, you watch it and you go, oh, okay, so she made up her mind. She's going to go and kill him. But think about this. Think about the fact that she has just suffered through the pain of knowing that she killed Arnold. And then it's revealed that it wasn't in her control. So she's absolved of that guilt, right? She's absolved of the guilt of killing because she was instructed to. She didn't have a choice in it. She's programmed that way. This time, she's willing to take that guilt on all over again to kill another human being. So that's, you know, that's a a major emotional uh, milestone for her. I honestly wish it had been portrayed better. But again, plot-wise, that worked really well for me, and and that's a huge decision to be made by a person. Yeah, and he says, you've suffered a lot to get your freedom, and he said, you still have to suffer some more. So the the fact that she now, again, she's been absolved of that first sin, for her to go right now and to relive that again, uh, I think is a big step for her. I just love how he's setting everything up, right? Everything's coming into motion for Dr. Ford, right? The fact that Bernard shows up and he doesn't bat an eye tells you, like you said, Big D, this was the plan all along, right? The fact that he's putting every, he's laying out the cards, right? And everyone, like, or he's laying out the dominoes and the, you know, they, they keep falling, right? In the exact order he's setting them up. One of the things that I really enjoyed though, is the idea when you talk about the painting, the Michelangelo painting, I did some research on that and it, this was, a fairly recent revelation, right? I thought maybe this was some writers in the writer rooms that came up with this, but no, there's an actual gynecologist, Franklin Meshberger, floated this theory more than uh, two, about two decades ago, so about 20 years ago, which in my mind is pretty recent, right? Uh, in the Journal of American Medical, uh, the, the AMA, there's also, though, some controversy, though, that a rival group of researchers believe the shape is a uterus, Right. I, I mean, if you look at it to me, guys, and once and you look at the comparison, there's a great article that we'll post on Twitter and on shadowntv.com 
that shows like if you were to cut a mine directly in half and then look and compare that to the to the painting, it looks exactly like it. And we know that Michelangelo, in you know, as a Renaissance man, he used to actually do this. He used to like you know be involved in you know very rudimentary surgeries and you know cut up brains and things like that and use that. So um, do we think that to you though, guys, if you look at this, is it a brain in your mind or is it a uterus? I mean, Dr. Ford knows all and he says it's a brain. So I'm going with brain. Yeah. And I, I also really want to just make it clear that the importance of what we see in the simple scene of Dolores sitting alone in the chair, we see the moments where Dolores becomes truly conscious, where Arnold is asking, do you know whose voice you've been hearing the whole time? And her mind transitions from Arnold to Ford and ultimately to her own. She's now sitting across from herself. The consciousness has now bootstrapped and truly it has gone from the original bicameral mind, which was an external voice, which would kickstart self-consciousness. We're seeing it here. She realizes the voice she is now listening to is her own. She's not following a narrative. She's completely acting on her own fruition. And the next act will be her first ever truly sentient thought. So let me ask you guys this. And, and, and we had a lot of debate on this over the last couple of days since the episode aired. I'm in the belief that Dr. Ford uh, has truly become God. And, and my idea of God is that you give people the free will, but yet they still follow you, right? They're still following in your footsteps. They're still, you're, they're still going on the same path that you are, are leading them down. Right. They, they, it's not like a, it's not like a dictator. I think Gene, you, you use the analogy in North Korea and listen, if you're listening to this in North Korea, kudos, right? Yeah. Kudos for getting internet access. Yeah. Kudos for getting internet access. But when you think of a dictator, right? A lot of dictators uh, throughout history have considered themselves gods. Like they, they're, they're worshiped almost as gods. In, in the same vein, right? There's a pictures of them in North Korea, as we know, and I've never been to North Korea, but in documentaries, you you are required to have pictures of, you know, the you know, the fathers of the country, right? Up on, on, on your wall. And you're forcing people to act in a certain way. And you've built an entire country and rules and regulations around them following you. And if you compare that to Westworld, so far... Right, this idea of living in Ford's perfect world under his control, Gene. Again, you use the analogy before. It's almost like living in a in a highly regulated dictatorship. But to move beyond that and truly become almost like a religion in the true sense of it. Not you know, I'm not talking about you know. There's different you know people are going to have different probably takes on this. But when to me, right, my idea of of God and spirituality is that. I was taught, raised Catholic, that you we were given the, the the free choice, the free will, right? That was that was God's greatest gift to us, but He set us on a, a on a certain path, and hopefully, right, we're, we will be will be the best people that we can be. And if at the ultimately at the end of it, you will this journey, right, this maze that we're all on, the ultimate goal is to get to heaven, right? The or the idea of heaven, and maybe heaven is enlightenment, and it, it belongs to a lot a lot of different people. But let me just finish this off, Big D, and then, then I'll let you go. But this idea that Dolores has now achieved consciousness, and this idea that Maeve similarly has achieved consciousness, and maybe even Bernard a little bit, now they all understand. This was all Ford putting them on the path to do what he wanted, right? He programmed their narratives to do this. They achieve consciousness, but then they still do, in my opinion, what he wanted them to do. Right, he 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 wanted to, to Dolores. He wanted to self sacrifice at the hands of Dolores. He wanted Maeve to get off that train and get off, but he didn't program them to do that. Is that the ultimate achievement of God? Is when they'll do something without you telling them what to do? He's no longer playing God. In the past, he has, and his speech clearly tells it. He says it's the beginning with the birth of a new people and the choices they must make and the people they will decide to become. It begins in a time of war, and a killing, but this time by choice. He has played God to this point. He has created his creatures. They are now off on their own. All right, so so big question, though, big question. Was that truly the human Dr. Ford that self-sacrificed himself, or was that a robo-Ford? Because we're given different little hints that it could be something else. Right, it could be a Robo Ford that self sacrificed him. 
Right. Dick mentioned earlier that, that Ford shakes hands with uh, Dolores. Actually, he doesn't. He shakes hands with Bernard. And it's a very interesting scene, the way it's shot, where he extends his hand, and it's kind of there for a while. And then you see, you know, Bernard finally decides to reach out and shake his hand. A big deal, you know, after a guy just made you shoot yourself in the head, basically. But he, he shakes hands with him, and there's a close-up of the handshake. And I thought, to me, that was, and I think other people saw it too, that was a nod to Westworld, uh, the movie, and, and that reference to the, you know, you could tell by their hands, basically. It could have been a hint there that he is, in fact, not human. It's also the first shot in this episode when Arnold wakes up Dolores, version 1.0. He puts out his hand, they have a shake, and he stands her up. So it could very well be the creator and the master either meeting or saying goodbye. It could be a complete circle. For me, story-wise, it works best that that is the actual Ford who dies because... As Big D said on the Instacast, he's stepping aside. He's making space for a new era. This speech means nothing if he's actually staying alive, other than the fact that it could just be, a, a you know, again, a huge you know, decoy, a huge ruse. Um, a couple people have, have postulated, what if Ford is the, the body being printed down in the basement of the cottage? That either that, That's the Robo Ford, right? And it's gone both ways. Some people say it was Robo Ford who got shot in the head, and real Ford is going to hide in the background and pull the strings. Other people said that Ford allowed himself to get killed, but wants a Robo Ford to help advance, uh, you know, everything while still being a host. You know, maybe he's he's putting himself into the experiment. And yeah, it could go lots of ways. But for me, I really, really, truly hope, uh, from my sense of poetry, my sense of writing, that that Ford did die in this incident, and that and that's the end of him. Yeah, and I think it would cheapen her first true decision. If her first true decision is to murder him, and in the end he turns out, ha ha, you know, it wasn't really me, you know, you, you murdered a robot, it, it, it totally cheapens that. And I also took really a, a moment for that goodbye. When they're downstairs and Ford is leaving, he says to her, good luck. This is a goodbye. I, I don't believe this is a, a trick. This is him t- stepping aside and letting his creatures go on without him. Counterpoint, Arnold also says good luck, and then Bernarnold pops up. So, I mean, again, maybe someone decides to make a Ford because they're like, oh, what are we going to do without him? One of my favorite little nods in that whole when Bernarnold shows up during the Ford speech is when he walks past Man in Black, and Man in Black through that entire episode has has, has longed to meet the Arnold, and then they, they actually pass by and give each other this look. This That was one of my favorite moments, and that's why I love this show so much. Yeah, he grabs, he takes that last shot, grabs the bottle of whiskey or the bourbon, starts walking off with it, and then they just have that. Yeah, it's kind of that, like, uh, like a, a, you know, when a dog passes by another dog, and they got to take that double take, kind of have a sniff. Yeah, Jonathan Nolan was asked about this in the Entertainment Weekly, and I'll quote. Uh, It says, we were very lucky to have one amazing season with Anthony Hopkins. We love working with him. As for the show, where it goes, the characters, we've well established we're playing in a more advanced rule set in terms of death and resurrection than other projects I've worked on. So I would say, assume nothing. What, What does that mean to you, Gene and Big D? I mean, again, I think Anthony Hopkins can make some appearances again. Is he going to get as much screen time as season one? Doubt it. I think this means that we're going to see a Robo Ford or at least some flashbacks. I I do believe, though, uh, and it was hinted at if you read the entire uh, Entertainment Weekly article that, again, we'll post on ShoutOutTV.com. It was hinted at that it was truly the human Dr. Ford sacrifice. And from a storytelling perspective, I agree with you, Big D. Uh, I would hate to see in season two it pops up and it's like, no, I was alive the entire time. That was just a decoy. Like that would be that'd be that's a giant trope we've seen before. And I wouldn't like that. Again, if we want to get really into the technicals of it too, a, uh, a host should have a shield that would prevent the the bullet from passing straight from the back through the front. And I think that's why they had the glass break too, was that it shows that it went straight from the back through the front of the head and out the front. So again, that wouldn't make a lot of sense unless the ones that he builds in the basement are kind of have softer skulls or something. We know that uh, at least Dolores became conscious, and we believe, at least I do, and I want to get your take on this, that Maeve became conscious. When she got off the train, there was a nod. That was her That was her awakening, right, of, of being conscious in, in her search for the daughter. But how many other hosts became conscious, in your opinion, in, C- in episode eight? I'm sorry, episode episode 10. I apologize, episode 10. Episode eight, none. Uh, no, episode 10, I, I would say, you know, 
Dolores is special, and and it, again, it undermines how special she is if if everybody's coming conscious all the time. Now, I think everyone's on the path, everyone's in the maze, in a sense. But she is definitely, uh, to me, the the only one. I shouldn't say definitely. I I imagine she's the only one who's who's made it. Even Maeve, she could be making an act of of defiance. There's a difference between consciousness and sentience, and I think that's an important distinction to make. That consciousness is is being aware. And you could be aware and making decisions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sentient. You don't have feeling, right? You you don't you don't have a sense of self. She doesn't. She may not know who she truly is. Having that 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 final breakthrough where her inner monologue is herself. Um, again, though, the, the argument could be made, and I tweeted about this earlier that that all of it's an illusion. And some people have talked about it before. I think Sam uh, wrote into us and kind of talked about that too. That all of it could be an illusion. In fact, consciousness is not really a thing. Um, you know, when you wake up from sleep and you, you know, you're you, but how do you know that? Right? Like it's, it's all a matter of, of your brain telling yourself that. And I'm a firm believer that everything that exists, your entire consciousness, everything, it's all inside a physical lobe of your head. And if that's destroyed, you're destroyed. You know, at the end of it, I, I felt that this was overall a satisfying conclusion to season one. Uh, it answered a lot of questions. It opened up a lot of new ones. I thought the transition from season one to season two uh, is is on point. Um, you know, I wish it was 2017, but I think it's going to be great. Uh, we're going to have something to look forward to in 2018. Was there anything that was left unquestioned that you really, truly wanted to have wrapped up before season one ended? Yeah, for me, it goes back to what I said kind of at the beginning of this, of this episode of the deep dive, was that in the beginning... We were presented with all these questions, uh, philosophical questions, about you know, um, you know, what is a god? What does it mean to have free will? Um, the question I keep asking is: Is consciousness real? And I, I'm left that I, I really hope the show is going to answer those questions. It, it put those questions out there, and then never really quite answer them. It doesn't take a definite stance on on what it is you know, to, to be human versus what it is to be inhuman. And and really, it's got a platform now. People are ready for those answers. People are paying attention. And I only hope that as we move forward, it actually goes into answering some of those deeper questions. So, Big D, what are the questions leading into season two? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm much like the man in black at the end of this episode. I'm standing there. I got shot in the arm. I see a horde of uh, hosts coming at me. And I got a little smile on my face. I'm excited. I think uh, next season, I think, will be mayhem. I think uh, the writers have a clean slate to, to shape their story, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited. I think the season flew by, uh, and I'm, I'm just excited for what the future brings. Who do you want more of in season two? From, from a character or maybe even an actor perspective? You, you can never have too much Maeve. I told you I want the Maeve and... And Hector Roadshow, the two of them together, comedic gold. Gene, I'm gonna sound like a real homer here, but a uh, big fan of uh, Lewis Hertham, and I'd love to see some more Peter Abernathy. I, I still go back to. I know we did the list of our favorite, you know, of of, of top scenes, you know, um, out of the show, and his his still, you know, moved me deeply. It was one of the things that got me hooked on the show. Was just was just what a amazing performance that was and he was just on the show so briefly and i really felt robbed by that i hope that he finds his way back into the narrative yeah i'd be disappointed if i didn't see more peter abernathy our boy lewis hertham i'm excited though that we're gonna have uh jeffrey wright assume more of a, a dr ford anthony hopkins uh in 2018 but uh I'd, I'd be i'd be remiss if i didn't say i wanted to see more i wanted to see more uh felix and sylvester i want to see my boy ptolemy and uh and Leonard, Leonard Nam. So those are those are my characters that I want to see lean up into season two. So that being said, is there anything before we shut down the deep dive and get ready for Thursday's Westworld Telegraph? Or are we good, boys? Yeah, I think just one thing about the telegraph. Uh keep throwing in your theories about what we've seen, but I think also if you have an idea of where the story's going or where you'd like to see it go, I think that'd be interesting. I've been reading through some of the ones uh, already that, that we've gotten um, since the last Telegraph, and there's, there's again, some really, really smart stuff um, that, uh, that really bears some, some heavy uh, kind of retrospective looks back at the season, um, and, and really excited to share those with you guys on Thursday. 
Yeah, if you want to send in your thought, theory, analysis, or suggestions for what you think is going to be coming up in season two, that email address is hosts at chatontv.com. We continue to add all of your theories to our website. Just click on the Westworld Telegraph as you navigate to chatontv.com. Make sure you follow us on social media. Uh, we're everywhere. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Just look for at Chat on TV. Uh, how are the snaps going, Gene? We still getting a lot of those? Yeah, the snaps are pretty great. Um, people are being really patient with me as I send them things like, uh, you know, uh, pictures of my dog, Chat on Grass, and and myself with masks on and stuff like that. Uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, I haven't cracked under all the pressure to to show my face. I feel like some sort of a bizarre geek Batman. Um, and, uh, so far, so far we've been we've been okay on that. But yeah, I really appreciate the interaction on Snapchat. It's it's really fun to kind of get to interact with people. And again, I love seeing those pictures uh, and videos of uh, of people watching the podcast or listening to the podcast or watching the show wherever they are in the world. It's really cool. Yeah. Also, uh, a lot of people uh, are starting to send us pictures of their shirts. If you've received your shirt, uh, please make sure you send a picture of that or a snap uh, uh, to our social media. Uh, make sure you tag at Chat on TV. Uh, if you, for those who uh, have ordered their shirts but they haven't come in yet, they're coming in the second batch. They should be here this week, and we will uh, allow we will send you out an email with your tracking number uh, once they arrive. Uh, we're we're gonna keep this podcast going. Uh, we're with uh, more Westworld stuff again. We've reached out to Ptolemy and Lewis Hertham uh, to come on the show and and do a do an interview. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, leave a five-star review. It's how we help grow the show, but we're everywhere. Fine podcasts can be found, including YouTube. Hey, listen, if you like the show and you're on YouTube, hit the comment board section, defend your boys, Roger, Gene, and big D against some of the, some of the, some of the negative Nellies there. We'd, we'd love some of uh chat nation to give us some love there. Um, but, uh, I think that's about it. What else, what else do I normally do here on the, that's it, right? We're good. All right. Let's shut this puppy down. We'll see you on Thursday Uh, on behalf of my two hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert and Gene Lyons. This is the Raj. We will see you on Thursday for the Westworld Telegraph. 